specifically about the phase four uh, programs. And phase four allows us to have indoor meetings. And that became effective oh. yesterday. So we are allowed to have indoor meetings with no restriction on the number of people that can attend. Uh, the only restriction is that if you are unvaccinated, you're required to wear a mask if you're going to be within six feet of other people at the meeting. That is the only restriction. Uh, of course, it still goes by the other rules, you know, if you've had a temperature or you've got a cough or any of that kind of stuff, you know, please stay home. But, uh, you know, that's really the only restriction. They have also eliminated the 150 mile radius rule for outdoor activities. So that's good news. Um, so, uh, let's and keep on the subject of the indoor meetings. Uh, we, for the time being at least, are going to comp comp compress the surprise and Phoenix groups into one. And they will be meeting at the All Saints Church in Phoenix until we can get a feel for how many surprise people uh, or further West Valley folks are going to be participating. And so that first meeting in Phoenix is going to be on September 16th. And that is Thursday. Uh, if you may remember, the Phoenix meetings that we had in the past were always on the third and the fourth Thursdays of each month. I've been able to move them to the second and fourth Thursdays so that we can spread them out a little bit more. The reason we were on the third and the fourth is because the third was not available. The room was not available. And so uh, I had the opportunity, so I've moved it to the second and the fourth Thursdays. Uh, the same room uh, that we've always used, which I think is 102 or 201 or something 201. like that. 201. 201. Okay. Good. Uh, and the time will be 6.30 to 8.30, as always. Uh, there'll be a lot more information on that coming out. Uh, but you can mark your calendars for the Phoenix first meeting on September the 16th. Okay. The Gilbert meetings will be in the same place, uh, which is Spirit of Joy Lutheran Church. Um, we'll be meeting in the big fellowship hall like we always have. And that first meeting will be on September the 14th. Okay. Again, same time, 6.30 to 8.30 uh, in the fellowship hall. <clears throat> uh, and that's going to be the beginning of our uh, in-person indoor meetings for this fall. So it's been a long time coming, let's face it. Uh, you know, and I think we're all happy to get back together again. Uh, there are a bunch of other activities between now and then, but uh, we're trying to get the program set up. We have a lot of logistical things that have to be accomplished. Uh, so even though uh, as of this past Monday, we were able to have those meetings. We can't get to it until September. Because a lot of people are traveling, as you can tell. We've only got 16 people on the call tonight. Uh, in the past, it's been 25 or 30. So either they're watching the Suns game, like Tony, or... <laughs> <laughs> and she's still not responding, okay? Uh, or they're out of town like Todd and a lot of other folks. Uh, Gary's not here tonight because he's out of town. So that's just a couple. But those are two dates that are really important uh, to get the program kickstart in September. And then uh, the education meetings will be, uh, you know, later in the month. Uh, 
it will be the 28th in Gilbert and the 30th in Phoenix. Okay, and we're working on uh, those programs. So we're really looking forward to it. A um, couple of other things. So on the phase five uh, implementation, those are overnight outings. Uh, we are scheduling an outing to Silver Creek on October the 12th to the 14th under the assumption that we will get approval by October 1st. Okay, so again, if you want to mark your calendars, and this is just advance notice, we do have uh, rooms reserved in Sholo uh, so that we can fish those two days. There will not be a formal program like there's been uh, for Healing Waters for the opening of the season on the 1st. Uh, we knew we couldn't get approval for that anyway, so we didn't push it. Um, we don't know for a fact that it's going to get approved by October 1st, but we're kind of hedging our bets. As I say, we've made the reservations. Uh, Healing Waters National is doing some trial overnight trips with vaccinated and unvaccinated people to see how difficult it will be to try and manage them. Um, they're very limited. They, there are going to be, I think it's 10 trips to um, Freedom Ranch for Heroes in Montana. Uh, but half of the participants are going to be approved. And they've given us a very short window. In fact, I just got notified that if we're going to no nominate anyone for the Western region, it has to be done by Thursday, the day after tomorrow. Okay, making it almost impossible for us to do anything with it. Okay. Um, a lot of the information that we've been getting from National has been, you know, they've been dragging their feet on it, frankly, and then all of a sudden they pop up and they say, oh, aren't you lucky? Here's some new information for you. Okay, and it's effective tomorrow, that kind of thing. No time to plan or anything. It's been very difficult. But anyway, we're going to plan on that outing uh, to Shallow to Silver Creek, as I say, uh, October the 12th to the 14th. And we have capacity, uh, we have 10 rooms reserved, but we have not gotten confirmation yet that they will permit double occupancy, meaning two people in a room. Okay, if they do not approve that, it will cut down our capacity literally in half and it will make it a very expensive trip on a per basis, and we'll have to deal with that. But uh, when I'm telling you this is, is, so you know that there's some roadblocks that we have to get around here. We've, we've done as much as we can at this point. Um, we're very hopeful. As I said, Gary's made the reservations. They're looking forward to having us there. Uh, Hopefully, we can pull the trip off. Uh, if not, it will be early next spring before we can have any overnight trips, more than likely. Okay. Uh, as everybody knows, there's a lot of a lot of news about the virus, of new variants coming out. Uh, apparently, a lot of people are getting sick. Uh, it's really hard to tell what the CDC is going to do at this point, but Healing Waters will be following their guideline very carefully, ahead, like just like they've done throughout this whole thing. So um, we're just going to have to be light on our feet, as always, do the best we can, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to do that trip. Everybody is looking forward to it, I'm sure. We'd all love to get out to Silver Creek. Um, and hopefully the water won't be a bit muddy like Bill ran into. <laughs> By then, it should, monsoon should be over, so the water should be good and clear. So that's what's happening on 
the phase four and the phase five implementations. Okay. Anybody got any questions about that? I have a question. What, Mary? Rich, I think David had a question. Ah, David. Your your microphone is muted. Unmute your microphone, David. All right. Sorry there about you go. that. Uh, could you please? I meant to do that on the chat. Please uh, repeat that date at that date for uh, Silver Creek. October twelfth through the fourteenth. Thank you. Oh, uh, Mike, cloud your question. Yes, Rich, Mike, clap. Yeah, Mike. Will you, will you know if every one of the participants have had their shots or not? No. What we have been told is that we are not allowed to ask, and we are not allowed to keep any records on vaccinations. Uh, some people cite HIPAA rules. Others are concerned about privacy. It is more the same stuff that everybody's just being gun shy about all this information. Uh, what we're going to do, Mike, is everybody will be on, um, uh, you know, self proclamation, if you will. If you're not vaccinated, you got to take care of yourself. Okay. Uh, so and what if a guy was to just say yes? What, what if a guy was just to say yes? I have been at, I have been vaccinated. Please make a note of it. But for the record, you may not make a note apparently, but I have been vaccinated. Oh, okay. Well, then, yeah, we're just I, in in that kit. In that, uh, <laughs> if we're if that's just for example, right? <laughs> yeah, and I've been vaccinated too. Okay, I mean, and well, we've got three. I <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's but narrowing it down any, already there, Rich. <laughs> yeah. But don't anybody write that down. <laughs> okay. Can, can we now, just the real have problem the is that this, uh, this meeting is being recorded. So we've just made a permanent record of three people. Oops. <laughs> you know, so. No, that was just... Look. That was just a for example. I know. Uh, everybody's going to be on the honor system. It's up to everybody to take care of each other. It's as simple as that. And I will tell you one other thing, and that is that I will not be the policeman of who's vaccinated and who's wearing a mask. That's not my role. Okay? Not going to do it. Everybody's responsible for themselves. And if you're not vaccinated, then you have to act accordingly. Okay, but I am not going to walk around and say you need to be putting your mask on because you're four and a half feet away from Charlie. Okay, not going to do it. Okay, nobody should be expecting that. Everybody will be on the honor system and will be just fine. Okay, if anyone is uncomfortable with the conditions that we're going to be on then please stay home. It's as simple as that, okay? Uh, we're all big kids now. <laughs> and I wish some people in Washington would understand that. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, At least so, physically. Yeah, really. Uh, any other questions or comments? Good, then I will move on. Uh, I think you're all aware that uh, one of our storage units was broken into and cleaned out. Um, oh. We're in the process of restocking. Uh, we've got some things in already and uh, there'll be more replacements coming, but it will not impact any of our upcoming events, things that are coming up soon. Okay. Um, all the paperwork's been submitted to the insurance company and all that kind of stuff, and we're now approved to go ahead and buy replacements, but uh, it's going to be kind of a slow process. But it will not impact any of our uh, events that are coming up. 
Our next event uh, is August 11th, and all of you should have gotten an email from uh, Gary Showman. He's going to be the lead. Uh, he has also included information about water certs. And we talked about water certs before. Some of you already signed up for them, uh, and you've got that scheduled. Uh, you can sign up for that trip until the 28th of July, uh, but you do have to have your water cert, and it will just be an abbreviated uh, water service certification. It's not going to be the full-blown thing, uh, because our only trips where we will be on or in the water until next spring are the two trips to Woods Canyon. Okay. Um, in terms of Woods Canyon, uh, it's open again, but a couple of weeks ago it was closed along with uh, Willow Springs and all of the other rim lakes. Uh, we've had some rain, thankfully, so I think that's tamped down a lot of the fire risk. But any of these trips at this point, uh, you know, can get canceled at the last minute because of um, fire danger and fire closures. So keep an eye on your email if you're signed up for these trips. Um, make sure you know that we're still going. Okay, that kind of thing. So August 11th, Woods Canyon. And then on September the 15th is the next Woods Canyon trip. So if you can't make the one on August 11th, then about a month later, on September the 15th, he'll have another opportunity. Okay. Will that uh, be boats also? That will be boats also. Yes. We will have the boats for that. Um, and I will be the lead on that one. And uh, it should be good. We have a couple of volunteers ready for that. Uh, going back to the one on the 11th, right now we have 14 people total signed up. Um, we can handle some more, but we do need some people that have got their boat driver certification. So if you're interested in going on that trip and you have your driver's license, so to speak, uh, please get a hold of Gary and we can use your help. So that is just about all the announcements I have. Um, looking, yes. I'm sorry, on, on that subject, is there still an opportunity for people to go online and get their boat driver license? Yes, uh, it takes about three hours. Uh, if you go to Game and Fish, uh, their website, they list uh, four or five companies that um, on their website uh, that they sort of recommend, I guess, or endorse for doing the online training. Uh, there is a cost involved with it. Uh, I think it's about $30 and it's a one-time expense. Uh, sometimes those organizations offer a two-for-one special. Uh, so the content is all essentially the same, okay? If you can find one of the two-for-ones and you want a family member to take the course or something like that, that's what I did with my son uh, a couple of years ago. I wanted to sign up and I, I told him, hey, I got a freebie for you. You're signing up. <laughs> and he did. Takes about three hours. Uh, there's a lot of good information in it. And then you get your, your card. Okay, uh, so that's a good reminder. Thanks, Norm. A uh, couple of other things that are going on that are later in the year. Um, October 23rd is our annual Hooked on Healing motorcycle ride that Santan uh, Rotary Foundation is running for us again this late year. Normally it's in the spring. Uh, we didn't have a ride at all last year. We postponed the one in March to October. Uh, we will not be expecting any veterans to participate in that because of distancing and 
uh, CDC guidelines and everybody being extra careful. Uh, but Mark and myself and maybe some other volunteers will be participating. But they're working really hard on it for us and uh, looks like it should be a very successful fundraiser for it for us. Then two more dates. November the 6th, uh, Payson Fly Fishing Club will be hosting an outing for us at Green Valley Lakes. Okay, we all know how good that can be in November. And they always, they always feed us really well. <laughs> <laughs> and there's not a thing wrong with that. They had, the last time we were there, they had donuts that were as big as a dinner plate. It was unbelievable. Couldn't eat the whole thing. The first time in my whole life that I've never eaten an entire donut. And about a month after that, the last thing I've got to, for a date for you is December the 4th will be our, our annual holiday party. And Sun Lakes Fly Fishing Club will be providing some uh, support for us on that. Uh, most likely it will be in the same place at uh, Roadrunner, Roadrunner Park. Yeah, that's right. Uh, we're gonna try and have it there. Um, Mike, if Mike Clatt, if you can uh, arrange for tables like you have in the past for us, I suspect that it will be a much smaller party this year than it has been in the past, but uh, we're going to put on a, a big press to have as much uh, have as many people join us there as possible. Okay. Yes, Norm. Tony and Jet uh, agreed to do uh, Christmas Carol duets for us. Oh, is that right? Oh, wait a minute. I'm going to no. make a note of that. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> you're a troublemaker tonight. <laughs> tonight? <laughs> yeah, really, just tonight. Uh -huh. yeah. We, we want people. We want people to enjoy themselves. We don't want them running away with the singing, especially my singing. I don't know about Tony, but my singing. I didn't say where you were going to sing that. <laughs> Good. Should be fun. Yes, looking forward to it. So that's the end of my dates. Anybody got any questions or comments on any of that? Okay. Uh, Mike Clad here. I'll take care of the tables. Excellent. Thanks, Mike. Um, Question so I had. Hopefully. About the, uh, all all Saints been. Lutheran. Uh, the, fir the first one's going to be on the 16th. Is it also going to be on the 23rd or the 28th? The next one will be on the 30th, Thursday the 30th. Okay, so, That's so not the first one there is, a, is actually going to be on uh, third Thursday. The, the 16th. The 16th, yes. That should be the okay. second. Oh, wait a minute. Or 14. That's the third Thursday. Sixteenth is the third Thursday, and the thirtieth is the fifth. Oh, yeah, sixteenth is the fourth, is the third Thursday. So the yes. ninth is yeah. the second Thursday. Wait a minute. It should be the ninth and the twenty-third. Okay. Sorry about that. Oh, yeah. Work better. Yeah. And that's on September. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yep. September the 9th. So the 9th is correct. The 9th is correct. And the 23rd is correct. 23rd being the Gilbert meeting. Nope. 23rd being Phoenix. That's the second meeting in on Thursday the 23rd. So that'll be the second meeting of the month in Phoenix. Okay. So the 14th is correct for Spirit of Joy. Yes. 
and the 28th. And 14th and 28th. 28th so, okay. are correct. Yep. Good catch. Thank you. Um, before those happen, in both cases, we're going to have uh, you know, paperwork to do at the churches and all that kind of stuff. I'm all set with Spirit of Joy, but we'll have to do uh, a couple of things, getting keys and the like for uh, All Saints. But that's all details, so no more about that. But those are the correct dates, the 9th and the 23rd. Thank you. And the Christmas party will be the same potluck? Yes, it'll be the same format as in the past. Yep. Yeah. With the meat provided and the, everybody brings other stuff. Yep. Okay. Yeah, Sun Lakes Fly Fishing Club is going to provide uh, ham and turkey again this year, like they did a couple of years ago. So those guys are still being super supportive. They're working on uh, putting together an outing for us uh, in the fall also. Uh, just as a side note, some of you remember uh, going out with TFC to the Queen Creek Golf Course uh, that we usually do in September. That will not be happening this year because the golf course has been sold. And I'm told they're going to be building houses on it. So that one uh, will not be happening. Um, so anyway, be one year, wet house. Next year it will be in their backyard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah really yep that's going to be one wet house in that lake i would think so yep but hey waterfront property is a premium you know <laughs> <laughs> yep all right any other questions or comments good i'd be acting up it's Mary's turn. Mary, would you like to share your screen? Sure. Do our presentation tonight. Okay. Can everybody see that? <laughs> yes, thank you. Okay. Yes. Okay. I will preemptively apologize for putting anyone to sleep. Um, this one's a, a little bit more of a technical talk. And uh, so hopefully we can get through this and I won't put everyone in a coma. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna talk tonight about can fish see colors and that sort of thing. Um, this talk actually kind of developed off of some stuff that I found off of the last talk I put together, which was about fly selection. And there were some things about, um, you know, different color flies being something that fish really key in on. And that got me thinking, well, why do they key in on that? Um, so um, I kind of did a little more a little more hunting and pecking on it and uh, found a couple good articles off of midcurrent.com um, and their science section that kind of addressed this phenomenon of flight. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about tonight. All right, let me make this bigger. I've only got 14 slides of content, so hopefully I won't get too long-winded on this. All right, so sort of three, broke this up into three sections. Um, some, this is the part that might put people to sleep a little bit. We're gonna talk a little bit about physics, ah, physics of light, and a little bit about um, eye anatomy. And then we're gonna kind of talk about how that physics of light is affected, how water affects that, how that physics of light presents itself. And then the third section is, okay, how does it, tie together with your fly selection. Um, so that's going to be our three general uh, areas of, of uh, talk tonight. All right, so can fish see color? Um, the short answer is yes. Um, so if that's the only answer that you wanted, you can tune out now and you know go back to the sun's game and you know 
check in every few minutes and make sure I haven't put everybody to sleep. Okay. Um, but there have been some studies um, that have suggested that fish are actually able to create a clear image. They're able to detect motion and they um, have the ability to um, actually create a fairly clear image um, with color. Um, so their eye ends up being very much in structure and anatomy um, like our own. Who would have thought? Fish can see like people can see. All right, so the physics of light. All right, brace yourselves. All right, so light really interacts with um, objects in this world in three manners. Um, there's absorption of light waves, which essentially means that those light waves hit an object and that object absorbs that light those light waves and doesn't re-release that light wave in any form ever again. There's reflection, which essentially is those light waves come in and this only happens on non-transparent objects. So things that are solid, not glass. Okay, um, so light comes in, it hits that object and then it bounces off. And um, that bouncing off um, ends up being what we see for color um, in most cases. And then there, the third way that light interacts with objects is transmission. This is like with glass and your windshield and that sort of thing. Transmission just means that the light waves will come in, they'll strike the object, but they'll pass through and continue on as a light wave. So it's it, that, what it, that object that is striking does not present any sort of a barrier to that light wave. All right, just a little more physics. All right. so. What, are, what we see for color um, is dependent upon which light waves are absorbed and which ones are reflected. Those, that's really the two, two components of how light waves interact with objects that produce color sight for us. Um, so if a light wave is reflected off of um, an object, the color that we see is the color that is reflected off of it. And every other color that we are not seeing is color that is absorbed, all right? And then, um, so for example, if you take a red apple, when you're looking at a red apple, um, the light waves that are being reflected is the red, red wave of light. It's hitting the surface and it's bouncing off and that's what our eyes can see and perceive. Every other color in that color spectrum, the orange, the yellow, the green, the blue, the indigo, the violet, that all gets absorbed by the surface of that apple. So we don't see it, it just gets absorbed and it's not seen again, okay? All right, so there's a little physics. Okay, just making sure I haven't totally lost anybody yet. Apparently Perkins has figured out how to uh, adjust the laws of physics and he's standing on the ceiling. All right. And his boss just doesn't like that. He thinks it's not right. Okay, so the long answer of this, how this whole light spectrum, the visible light really kind of comes into play. Um, Light waves in the visible light spectrum, the red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, that is the visible spectrum that we can see. There's other, spec there's other things on that spectrum of energy. It's actually considered energy. It's another physics thing that's starting to get into a realm that I can't explain very well. So I'm gonna try to avoid that as much as I can. Um, but there is, it's, it all has to do with this waveform that light passes, is it emitted? Um, so the measurement of the distance from the top of one peak to the top of the next peak, there's, it, it ends up being a measurement and it's measured in nanometers. So your 
wavelengths and colors that are considered the long wavelengths are red because there's a greater distance from the top and center of one wavelength or one peak to the top and center of the next peak in the wave form that is produced by red light. On the opposite end, you've got violet, which has a, very, has a considerably shorter um, peak to peak distance um, as far as in nanometers. Um, so that particular uh, waveform has what's considered more energy, therefore it penetrates and goes a little further. So why is that important? Well, it's important because it ends up being how our eye, and because a fish's eye is very much like our eye, um, how it gets interplayed and how it all kind of comes together. Um, so those different wavelengths of light have to pass through all the structures of the eye. So there's um, the cornea just in front of the lens. That lens is attached to a couple muscles that are able to stretch and make it a little longer or relax and make it a little bit um, uh, you know, more round. And that actually just helps with the focusing of, of the image that our eyes are looking at. And then that, way, that light wave after it passes through the lens has to travel towards the retina. Now the retina is where all of those um, cells that interpret color are located. So that's in this little diagram, that's actually gonna be that yellow semicircle that's on the back side of the eye and it actually ends up attaching to the optic nerve, which goes into the brain and the, that's how it's all. Um, so inside that retina, that yellow part, there are these different cells. There's actually two different kinds of cells that um, are involved with, this, with sight and with uh, color interpretation. So you've got your cones, that's one cell, and you've got rod. That's the second cell. Now the cones are involved in kind of your daytime vision. They actually produce the most amount of color processing and as far as how, what we see. The rods, that other, other cell that's involved with sight, um, they actually have to do with a lot more of your low light um, conditions and how that's interpreted. So, um, your sight at dusk, if right now, actually, if you were to look out the window, it's getting pretty dark. So more of our rods are starting to be activated and fired and help us interpret what it is that we are seeing. Now, both of those, both of those cells, the rods and the cones, um, have the, what's something that's called photopigment um, in those cells. And some of the cells are photopigmented to respond more to one color wavelength than another. So with, with um, a fish eye, they're actually able to see red, green, and blue. Those are the three um, photopigments that are involved in creating color um, interpretation. Um, so that's kind of <clears throat> how that all sort of comes into play. Um, so you have a lot of red from it being reflected off of that red apple and it's reaching those red um, photo pigmented cones. Well, our brain says, okay, that is red because all of those red photo pigmented cones are being stimulated. So that's what our, how our brain interprets that is a red object. And we happen to know that it is a red apple. Um, so that's kind of how that part of the anatomy sort of works. Um, one thing that I did find out that was interesting was that with the rods, now the rods are the ones that are involved with low light condition um, scenarios, they actually have a, uh, have a, a higher responsiveness to that green wavelength. So those rods are actually have photo pit, are photo pigmented more towards the green um, wavelength, um, which kind of makes sense as you know when 
things start getting dark, everything kind of starts becoming more kind of of a green shade um, when we're looking at, at things. Um, we're seeing less richness of color because more of those greens are coming through. Um, there's another area um, that's not on our, my little diagram, unfortunately, but it is it's also very important in um, sight. And that's an area of the retina called the fovea. Now the fovea is involved with um, sharpness of an image or it's called vision acuity. Um, so it's essentially involved with making an image as sharp as it can. Um, and there happens to be um, fewer of those red photopigmented cones Cones are the color, daytime color um, ones. Um, there's fewer of those blue photopigmented cones in that fovea area. And they found that, that since blue is closer to violet, so it's got a shorter wavelength, peak to peak wavelength, um, that short wavelength actually reduces the um, uh, sharpness or that vision, visual acuity um, that an image can be interpreted as. So the fovea tends to have fewer of those blue um, photopigmented cones in, in that area. Kind of interesting. Okay, next slide. All right, so how does this all work? Um, so I already kind of talked about how the human and the fish eye have three different color cones that our, our eyes are specifically tuned to, the blue, the green, and the red. Um, so a beam of light that um, has a short um, wavelength uh, is going to be interpreted more as a blue. And then something that's going to have um, a longer wavelength of about roughly about 600 nanometers is going to be seen more as a red. And that just happens to be, happens to be involved with the wavelength um, measurements. So that, that's where the, that measurement kind of comes in into play with um, which uh, cones are stimulated when we're looking at things. Um, one thing that I did find was kind of interesting is that, okay, so we've got red, we've got green, we've got blue. Well, how do we see the color white then? Well, that actually ends up being happening when all three of those color cones are stimulated in equal equal measure and then our our brain actually ends up perceiving that equal measure of each of those cones being stimulated as the color white or achromatic that's the fancy term for it um, in order for color vision to actually occur and happen we have to you have to have two of those uh photopigmented cells or the cones or the rods, they need to be stimulated at the same time in order for color to be perceived. So when we're in a nighttime dusk situation and only the rods are really being uh, activated, we essentially become colorblind um, and, and fish are the same way. So in those low light situations, at, if you're fishing at night, um, for those big, massive browns that are out there, um, they're, they're essentially colorblind. So color is not going to particularly matter so much um, in those scenarios. So that's something to keep in mind when you're picking your fly. You don't have to pick the biggest, brightest colored fly in the box because at night, they can't really see it anyway. All right. Okay, so... That's how light sort of works in, in the air. How does it work in the water? Now, water's a little bit different because it is a clear, um, uh, a clear object. So it, it sort of reacts kind of more on that transmission um, effect of how light interacts with objects. So light does actually transmit through the water. However, water in and of itself has an effect on um, how that visible light is actually 
um, works or is seen or how deep it's actually seen as well. Because water um, does two things to light waves. It scatters and it absorbs some of those light waves. So that scattering effect happens when there's a lot, there's actually part particles in water. Um, and you see this, especially you'll see this on, you know, a river that's running really, really fast or after they let some bunch of water out at the dam, um, the water just becomes a little muddier, a little murkier. Well, it becomes muddy and murky because there's more particulate that is floating around in suspended in the water. So it's kind of like if you've ever been in a situation where there's really heavy fog um, and a fog is essentially there's particulate in the air and you you notice if you've ever been in that situation you you'll see um you'll notice that you can't really see very far you can't really see colors all that well and you certainly can't see colors in the same manner as if you if there were no fog at all um so that scatter and that particulate um in the air tends to have uh an effect on how how well um, light waves actually pass through water. Um, the other way that uh, water is affects uh, the color is um, the absorption. It actually absorbs some of that light. So what that ends up meaning is that colors are, that absorption actually doesn't allow those colors to be seen as, as deep or as far as a distance as if you were looking at the same thing in air. Um, so what that ends up really meaning is that those colors are gonna start fading out um, and be fading out and not being able to be seen really anymore by our eyes and a fish's eye, um, the, the further, further down in the water that you go. Um, and that diagram over on the right, Kind of shows generally speaking the distances where those those color color bands start fading out where you you can't really see them anymore so generally speaking what they have found is that with that absorption of light in water at roughly about 10 feet actually about 60 percent of that total light spectrum all the colors, red, blue, green, all of them. Um, at 60, roughly about 60% are absorbed by water at about 10 feet. And at 10 feet, almost all of that red color, remember red's the one with the, the longest peak to peak measurement wavelength, um, that actually is, is almost completely absorbed at 33 feet, 85% of your total spectrum, all the colors, are, it has been absorbed by water, not really able to see it anymore, and absolutely all of the reds, oranges, and yellows have been absorbed. So at that depth, color really doesn't matter, especially if you're going to have something that's red, orange, or yellow in it. Also at 10 feet, um, they've, they've noticed that those colors with the longer wavelengths, which is your reds, your oranges, and your yellows, they tend to have the, the longer peak-to-peak -peak wavelength. Instead of looking red, they start looking gray. And then the deeper you go, they become black. They don't even look red anymore. They, look, they start looking black, um, which actually sometimes is a good thing when you're when you're uh, fishing. So, so it's not necessarily one of those things where you say, okay, I got to throw out all of my red flies because they're no longer good anymore. No, they're still good, but they just look different than what we would expect them to look like at the further down in the water column that you go. How many people have heard something about fish being able to see UV light? Anybody? Okay, anyway, <laughs> the, the short answer to um, the question of can fish see UV light is 
yes, sort of. <laughs> so there's, a, of course, there's a caveat to everything, right? Um, and then the, then the question becomes, okay, so does it matter that they can see UV light? And the answer to that becomes, it doesn't really matter that much um, as to whether or not they see UV light. So what is UV light? Sorry, we're going back to a little more physics again. Um, so this little diagram that I have on the slide um, is, is showing that an increase in distance of peak to peak distance of a wavelength as you're going from radio waves to infrared to the visible spectrum to your ultraviolet to x-rays to gamma rays. Now gamma rays, that's that's the realm that I live in at work because I'm trying to actually take a picture of those gamma rays. Different topic for a different day. Um, but that visible um, wavelengths, those visible wavelengths are kind of in the middle there. And then ultraviolet is just above that. So the wave, the peak to peak wavelengths are actually even shorter than um, the peak to peak wavelength on the violet, which is the shortest wavelength of the visible light spectrum. Um, so that's kind of where where ultraviolet light is as far as okay, where is it as far in regards to visible light? Um, the how it actually ends up manifesting in fish itself, though, and the fish that have actually been studied because studies have been done on this. Um, are your game fish, your carp, your bluegills, your bass, your trout. Um, they've even done some, some uh, uh, studies on some of your saltwater species, like uh, uh, tuna and that sort of thing. But for our purposes, we're going to talk about, be focusing on the trout and the, and the other fish that we're more likely to be catching. So what they have found is that in young fish, so these are the, the, the small ones. They actually do, in their eye, in the retina, have an ultraviolet sensitive cone present. However, as that fish ages, gets bigger, that ultraviolet sensitive cone in the retina ends up converting itself to a blue sensitive cone. So what that ends up telling us is that as that fish gets larger, and is able to feed on things that are a little bit bigger than that little little plankton that it was eating when it was really really young um that ultraviolet sensitive cone is not as important so that little plankton that's in the water it actually fluoresces under ultraviolet light um so that's kind of you know the reason why maybe fish have developed this this ability to have these ultraviolet sensitive cones when they're young that's what they're feeding on they need to be able to see it and find it and that's that's the reason for having um, this particular adaptation in their eye but as they start getting bigger it's not nearly as necessary um so it starts getting converted to that blue sensitive uh, cone. Um, however, having said that, they all have found in older fish that there is still a small number of those ultraviolet sensitive cones that end up being in the top part of the fish's eye. So what that ends up meaning is that um, if you kind of think of it, this then requires you to sort of put yourself in the place of a fish. When a fish is, is in the water and it's looking up towards the surface, the light rays from above are coming in, hitting the eye, and actually hitting the retina on the lower part of the eye. So if those ultraviolet sensitive cones are more on the top part of the eye, they're not being activated when that fish is looking up. However, if there's ultraviolet light coming through a water column reflecting off of something below the fish, that light is coming up into the fish's eye and hitting those ultraviolet sensitive cones on the top part of the fish's eye. 
So it does still probably come into play um, with you know certain scenarios, but it's not nearly as necessary as when that fish was younger. Um, now there is a little bit of a downside to ultraviolet light um, and, and how it affects sight. Um, they have found that ultraviolet wavelengths actually produce more scatter across the retina, um, which makes it harder for um, the eye to focus on anything other than those short wavelength um, uh, light spectrums. So anything in that red, orange, and yellow is going to have a harder time really being able to focus on, on those particular wavelengths as they're coming into the eye. And they've also noticed that ultraviolet wavelengths um, will actually end up reducing color, what they call color constancy, which just ends up meaning that at different distances, the color doesn't stay the same. So red doesn't stay the same. And this, they've actually noticed this in, in air. So if it's, if it's that way in air, it actually kind of gets magnified a little bit in water as well. So at five feet, red doesn't quite look like or it looks like red, but then you put it out to 10 feet and red looks a little bit different. It doesn't quite look like red anymore. So as, as it gets further away, um, the, the color actually ends up changing a little bit as far as what the eye is able to perceive. And then, um, so if that's, if UV light's got a downside, then fish have had to figure out a way to adapt to it as well. Um, so how they have done that is that they've actually developed, uh, fish have actually developed a pigment in their lens of their eye that ends up restricting that UV wavelength, um, the UV wavelength ability to actually reach the retina. So it's almost like there's a little filter that they have developed. Um, so that's, that's why we kind of say, does it matter that they can see UV light? No, not really, because there's really only going to be certain scenarios where UV light kind of comes into play. Um, as a fisherman, where it comes into play is the fact that we can now tie our flies with fluorescent material. Fluorescent material under UV light makes that color kind of shine through a little bit more so and at deeper depths as well. And the time of day when you will have more UV light present is on cloudy days and under those low light conditions. Um, so does it matter? Eh, kind of, but not really. All right. Have I lost anybody? Nope, not me. Okay. I'm good. Does that fish need to splash his tail? And, and get 50 bucks from his buddy because the fisherman just came back from his car because he heard him splash his tail. It gets me every time. I know it does. <laughs> it's like, oh, they're back. <laughs> okay. Section three. How does this all tie together? Okay. Um, so this that's how a fish can see color. Um, so what does it all mean? Um, so it just kind of maybe has a little bit of an effect on the fly that you select um, to go fishing with. Um, so, but there's, while color is a factor, it's not the only factor. You still have to take into consideration an active hatch. Um, if you've got an active hatch of damselflies going, you don't want to throw out some big fluorescent thing and expect that the fish are going to jump on that when they've got a bunch of damselflies that they're mowing down on. Um, so if there's an active hatch, you need to take that into consideration. Does your fly have other things that will draw its attention to it? Does it have motion in the water? We've already kind of figured out that um, a fly with motion draws attention and the, the fish will key in on that. Is the shape of your fly something that they're like, eh, I don't think so. Or is it, oh, yes, dinner. 
Um, so that those are the things that are still come into play rather than just color. Um, our game fish, um, they seem to use contrast actually a little bit. Um, so what that contrast means is what does that fly look like with something else behind it? Um, so for example, if you've got a big white fluffy puffy cloud behind a white colored fly, are they really going to be able to see that? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. Um, so having some contrast to your fly so that they can actually see it is also um, a factor. And then we've kind of talked already a little bit about the whole fluorescent materials. What the and what fluorescent materials will allow is for that fly and those colors of the fly to be seen at a deeper um, depth than if the material were not fluorescent. Just due to the way UV light does um, reflect off of that material and make it a little bit more visible. Uh, some things to also consider when you're uh, tying some flies and, and putting them in your box and looking through what you got. Um, so you kind of want to think about how does that fly actually look at the depth that you're intending to fish it. If you're intending to fish um, a red leech down deep, is it going to still look red? No, probably not. If it's anything deeper than 10 feet, it's going to start looking gray and black. Um, that doesn't mean chuck your red fly. It's just, you just need to know that it's not going to necessarily be the red that they're interested in. Um, black, anything that any of your flies that are colored black, it actually ends up being the least transparent color, meaning that it, it's going to, it's not going to be seen through. However, it gives a really good silhouette. So if you're in that situation um, where you've got uh, water that's a little muddy, a little murky, um, and this is actually jumping down to, to the bottom point, um, it's a, you're gonna end up um, having something that's gonna create a silhouette, and that silhouette is something that the fish are gonna be able to see and they're going to come in and investigate. So you kind of think of it like a, that day where you've got a lot, a lot of fog. Um, you can't really see the color of the thing that you're looking at, but you see the silhouette and you see the, the shadow of it. Um, so it's, it's, it does still have, have an effect on, on the fly that you may want to choose. Um, they've also noticed that if a fly has two colors in it, Generally speaking, the darker color should be over the lighter color. And by doing that, it actually gives that fly more contrast when the fish is looking at it. Because remember that fish is generally speaking, looking up towards it, not necessarily down at it. Um, so you wanna make sure it's something that that fish is maybe gonna see a little bit more effectively. And also they've noticed that it mimics bait fish. If you look at a little bait fish, they've got maybe a darker color band on the top of their body rather than the bottom of their bodies. bodies the bottoms of their bodies tend to be a lighter color. Um, if, you're, if you know you're gonna be fishing something deep, so if you're in a, at a lake and you know you wanna go deep, 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 like, like what Mark was fishing um, up at Woods Canyon, um, you're gonna maybe wanna have something that's gonna have some motion in the water as you're stripping it through. So that's that's not a factor to be, you know, tossing aside and going solely based off of the color. And when you've got, and we've already kind of talked about the, the heavy particulate in the water. Um, so you wanna pick something that that fish is gonna see and that's actually Actually where your black flies and your red flies that look black once they reach a certain depth they offer that good profile so that that darker fly that mark was using um was probably you know that was probably a factor for why that fish keyed in on it all 
All right. And so some other things to kind of think about when you're looking at your fly box and you're trying to figure out what one, just one to put on your line. Um, your time of day is always something to kind of think about. Um, is it dawn or is it dusk or is it midday? Um, what are your light conditions? What are your sky conditions? Is it clear or is it cloudy? Um, if it's, you know, a low light situation like a dawn or a dusk, you might want to pick a fly that's, that's going to, you know, be darker, like a, like a black or purple. Remember that? I think I remember in my talk about it, it saying that fish tend to like purple for some reason. Well, that's probably why. Because um, that purple wavelength of light is one of the short wavelengths. So it actually penetrates a little deeper, but even if you penetrate beyond, even if you're fishing beyond the level where that, that fly's <laughs> color can be seen, um, it's, it's gonna end up looking more black and it's gonna give that good silhouette, that good profile. If it's a cloudy day, um, you're probably gonna wanna try to find, some, find something in your box that's gonna have a bit more contrast so that it, it's, it's something that can be seen um, against those clouds. Because when that fish is looking up is he needs to be able to see, see that fly before he'll even go put in the effort of going after it. If it happens to be a clear day, um, your colors are gonna end up probably being a bit more true to what they look like in air. Um, even you know, as, as you start fishing down a little deeper. Um, just because more, more natural light is being able to penetrate through the water rather than on a cloudy day. Um, the deeper the fishing depth, um, the deeper you fish, the less color you're going to see on your fly. Um, so it's going to start looking more gray or black. Um, so that's something to always kind of keep in mind as well. And then your water conditions. Is it clear water? Is it muddy water? Um, muddy water, that color is not going to really come into play. It's, it's that fog scenario again. Um, so you're going to want to try to find something that's got a bit more uh, of that contrast or that uh, silhouette profile that the fish was like way to key in on. All right. Any questions so far? Thoughts, joys, concerns? Okay. All right. Oh, the fish story. You know, the fish stories and the Facebook pictures. Sorry, not getting into heaven. You nailed it, <laughs> didn't you, Mary? You got it. Yep, yep. Mark, it says. And I didn't even recognize, realize that it was, <laughs> there was, it was Mark, and we've got a Mark in our group. Sorry, Mark. <laughs> fits perfectly. <laughs> However, I kind of like the one on the right, uh, the, the joke on the right. Although, along with antimatter and dark matter, we've recently discovered the existence of doesn't matter, which appears to have no effect on the universe whatsoever. <laughs> All right. Okay, so here's my sources of where I got my information. Um, there's those two articles off of uh, MidCurrent. Um, one was, you know, specifically talking about fish eyesight and, and color, and the other was uh, the UV uh, factor. Um, most of the pictures I got off of off of the Google, and um, I also got some of the more sciencey pictures off of a, a website that's uh, talking specifically about physics and light and, and uh, human perception of it. Okay, that's it. Excellent. Let's go. Good job. Thank you, Mary. Excellent. Well done. Thank you. Congratulations, Mary. Hopefully, I didn't put anybody to Good sleep. Good job. Thank you. Well done, Mary. Well done. And I wasn't nearly as long winded as I was the last time. <laughs> you know, one of the other things that I thought of when you were talking is, you know, visibility fish have is uh, looking at the 
the need to have a, a clear line, a fluorocarbon, when the visibility is very good, very clear water. You need to have a line that the fish does not perceive as being different or out of place. Okay, yeah. Yep, that makes sense. And Mary, well, I, I also I learned. thought that uh, where color comes into play is for how we can see it when we're working with a particular fly. Uh, I, for one, have my eyesight isn't as good as it used to be. Okay, and having a fly that's got some bright colors on it sometimes makes a difference in how I fish. Um, and so if, especially if you're deep and you're losing all the color as far as the fish is concerned, when it gets to be about three feet of water and I can see it again, okay, that tells me it's time to pull it out of there and try again. <laughs> um, you know, and also, uh, you know, the brighter colors at times uh, give you an opportunity to see the fish actually take the fly. And I've noticed that on True. a number yes. of occasions, uh, especially on uh, the San Juan, where the water is super clear. And even the, a fly that is not that brightly colored uh, can be seen when the fish takes it. And sometimes that's, awesome. that's better than waiting for the tug. <laughs> because, they're, because they're really subtle sometimes and uh, and it's also a lot of fun to see the fish actually take your fly and when he picks it up and turns yeah. then you can set so, yeah. excellent really good info Mary you said at one point you said at one point something that stayed with me as fish age, the UV sensor cones are replaced by blue sensitive. So if I'm after the old big ones, deep, maybe black over blue might be a good combination. It might be, yeah. <laughs> yep. So, Something that's going to hit those hit those blue receptor sites yep. or those blue cells. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. With try, all I got to do is get fishing and try it, right? There you go. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was excellent. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you very much, Mary. Very Thank interesting. Hopefully it was of use. Okay. Thanks, Mary. And Mary, I can I can also tell you that we still have 16 people on the line. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> hey. We didn't and lose Tony's a back single live. one. So is the game is over. Is the game over, Tony? No. But I've been listening the whole time. <laughs> What's the score, Tony? Too much to not enough. <laughs> okay. 92 to 98. Okay. Uh-oh. There you go, 92 98. Three minutes left. Three minutes left, okay. Ooh. They got their work cut out for them. Yep. All right. Well, anybody have any other questions or comments or subjects to discuss? All right. Everybody wants to go see the last three minutes of the game. Yeah. So uh, we'll sign yeah, that's off. That's the here. most interesting part. <laughs> <laughs> Really well done, Mary. All right. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, guys. Good job. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. We'll see you good night. See you. Take care. All right. Have a good night, everybody. All right. Good water night. search. Good night, on. John Boy. Water search. <laughs> yes. And water uh, boat drivers. Need more. Hey, Norm, I had a question. Um, as far as the rest of us kind of getting water certs, are we going to hold off on that? Or is that something? Yeah, much, much of our gear disappeared, Mary, in that property. Oh, so okay. we won't even get it replaced until okay. sometime. So we might as well reset the two-year clock in 22. Okay, that sounds good.
Yeah. Okay. Good. All righty. No need to get wet then. <laughs> I'll let the volunteer man. Oh, um, <laughs> oh, 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 yes, maybe that's true. I, I need somebody to call you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and maybe on the 31st I'll be ready because I'll I'll have want be wanting to you know drown myself in my moving process.